Hi, welcome to this podcast for OCR Computing A-Level, um, which is based on the components of the processor. Now, this is for unit F451. Um, for this unit, you only need to know the definitions. You don't actually need to understand at the moment how everything um, works and communicates together. Um, in the definitions, you can, you can get some of that, but there are some key components that are missing that make understanding it um, without those key components a little bit difficult. Um, you've got two choices basically. If you, uh, the, the, the first way, which is I'm going to suggest at the moment, is to learn these definitions and think of ways of learning these definitions. Have a look at the different types of memory um, uh, techniques a video that I've uh, I will be putting up soon, and that might give you some ideas about how you can do it. But um, the other option is you can try to understand a little bit. There's a lot out there. Uh, that you could do to research to find a little bit more about each of these components. Just be aware that this is all you need to know really for this exam, the content that's in here. You don't really need to know much more than what is in this uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> however, there are a couple of links down below that I've put that might uh, offer you um, a bit more information if you do feel like you need to understand it with uh, a good animation that shows it. You will need to know this in more detail for um, F453, which is the A2 unit, uh, third unit next year. Okay, so the first area we're going to look at is the control unit, ALU, and the memory unit. So, the control unit. This manages execution of instructions. It uses control signals to communicate with other parts of the computer. It synchronizes actions and it controls the fetch execute cycle. Um, how can we remember this? Well, the control unit is in control. We've got a second point there, actually has the word control in it, so it controls signals to communicate with other parts of the computer. It synchronizes actions, a very similar comment that is to the one above. It synchronizes everything and makes sure everything runs in time and does things at the right point. Um, manages the execution of instructions, the word manage is another type of control word. Um, and finally, the last point again says controls the fetch execute cycle. So you should be able to remember that some of the key points there by the fact that it controls things. Right, the next part we're going to look at is the arithmetic logic unit. Again, this one is quite common sense. It carries out calculations. Arithmetic carries out calculations. It carries out logical decisions, e.g. if a value is a negative, then do something. So it does logical decisions. Well, the second part of the ALU is the logic. So it carries out logical decisions. It acts as a gateway to and from the processor. All right? Input output waits in the ALU until the control unit decides what to do with it. So it acts as a gateway to and from the processor. So any input output goes through it. How could we remember that? Well, maybe you could think of a, a gateway, uh, something to do with unit. You might be able to, to combine those if you want to think about it. But that's the last one um, that might be a bit more difficult to remember. But gateway to and from the processor. Third one here is the memory unit. So memory, first thing it says is stores the parts of the operating system that are in use. This is essentially the computer's memory. So think about your computer's memory. When you run a program, um, that goes into the computer's memory. So what program are we running right now? Well, obviously, we've got to have an operating system, and that is going to have some uh, data is going to be stored in the memory unit. So it stores parts of the operating system. The other thing that it will do will store any programs that are running or any applications uh, that are running. Programs applications being the same thing essentially. So, i.e. instructions that are required to be done. So, um, the program you might be running might be a word processing program and that means it will run the instructions that that word processing or so it will hold the instructions that that word processing um, software program application needs to do. Last thing obviously, what do we use? We use the operating system, we use programs, and we also use data. So it stores data that is currently in use that is needed by the operating system or those programs. So if we're using a file for um, <coughs> one of those software programs, then it will store the data for that file at that point when we're using it. Okay? So it's quite logical, really. Again, it's quite common sense. We can think about this when we think about how we use the computer. Okay, so those three shouldn't pose much of a problem if you can think of it those in those ways. You might think of other ways to remember them, um, but that's how I try to remember them. Okay, so I'll leave that there for a moment so you can pause if you want to, have a quick look. And then we'll move on to the registers. 
Now, this is where most people struggle because they struggle to get their head around the registers. If you struggle with this and you feel like you need to understand it, as I said, look at the link below uh, in the comments um, or the description of this video, sorry, and there is a link to uh, an animation. It contains more information than you need, but it might help you understand a little bit about the registers. So, we have the memory address register. This holds the address in memory currently being accessed. The next piece of data to be read or the instruction to be used. Okay, so MAR, sometimes it's called the memory address register. The address in memory currently being accessed, which will be the next piece of data to be read or the instruction to be used. All right, so um, that, again, it, it holds the address essentially. It should be quite common sense to understand that. Right, the program counter points to the address of the next instruction, controls the order that the instruction retrieved and executed, increments after being read, it counts, so it increments or pluses one after being read, it is altered as a result of a jump instruction. Now that's something you might not understand. If you watch the video, you might get, uh, sorry, if you watch the animation, you might get a bit better understanding about it. Um, however, this is where the code jumps to another instruction for some reason. So rather than doing the next one in the sequence, it might suddenly need to, for some reason, go to a different instruction for whatever reason. Um, you could possibly think of this uh, where you have an if statement and if something happens, um, then you do the, the line below. If it doesn't happen, then it jumps to a further uh, else statement later on, something similar to that. That is not the exact way it works, but that might help you understand it. You just need to know the definition. Now, there's four points there. Generally, you'll get questions that are only worth two. So two of those will give you the marks. Okay. The last one is the current, oh, sorry, not the last one. The next one is the current instruction register. Quite simply, stores the instruction currently being carried out. That should be very simple to remember. So two mark question, name one of the registers, current instruction register, stores the instruction currently being carried out. And then we've got the memory data register, stores data that is being transferred to or from the memory. So we should be able to remember that by what it says, memory data register stores data that's being transferred to or from the memory. So we need something to store the data that's going into the memory or out of the memory. And then we have the accumulator, stores the data that's currently being processed, stores the result of processing, i.e. the results of calculations from the ALU, all the input and output will go through the accumulator. Okay, so the data that's being processed, the results of processing, the results of calculations from the ALU, all the input and output will go through the accumulator. You might be able to relate that to some sort of betting slip if, if that's something you uh, are interesting or you know about. And there might be other ways to try and remember that. Have a little think and see, see what you can do. Um, but try and think of a way to rem accumulate or remind you of those things, associate those things. So I'll let you have a quick look at those registers. They're the five registers you need to know. You might be able to tie them in with what we've just looked at previously. Um, however, the definitions is all you need to know. You don't need to understand how they link in as I've described before. Right, well now we're gonna look at buses. Okay, so a bus, what is a bus? Well, a bus is a way of transferring data. So the data bus moves data between different parts of the processor. Direction isn't specified. Bidirectional, so data can travel in both directions one way at a time. Okay, it only goes one way at a time. Um, so bus transfers some sort of data. This will transfer data between different parts of the processor. The data bus moves data between different parts of the processor. The direction isn't specified. Bidirectional, so data can travel in both directions one way at a time. Okay, so they're the three things you need to know for the data bus. The address bus, common sense this one, transmits the address of where the data is being carried to or collected from in memory. Okay, so it's an address bus, it transmits the data, the address of where the data, sorry, is being carried to or collected from in memory. And the control bus transmits signals such as read-write to control the operations of the computer, transmits these signals to different parts of the processor as necessary. So when I said before the buses transfer data, they do, but it in a different way. Obviously these transfer data, whereas these are more to do with, this is to do with the address, but transferring address is still going to be obviously a bit of a data. That is, is what I mean for that. And obviously instructions, um, whether it be read or write, will also be 
a, um, a piece of data. However, you need to label these as the address and you need to label this one as the read or write to control the operations, okay? And it transmits these signals to different parts of the processor as necessary, as I said before. So just be clear on those three buses, okay? They're the three buses that you need to know. Right, finally, the last thing is buffers and interrupts. So we've got, what's a buffer and what's an interrupt? Well, a buffer, you might remember this in a train situation, is temporary storage, okay? It allows data to be transferred from memory to a peripheral device and vice versa. The type, it's a type of communication medium, it's serial or parallel communication, okay? Um, so th the main point there is the top one. Temporary storage to allow data to be transferred from memory to a peripheral device and vice versa. So that could be memory to your hard drive, remember. A hard drive is a peripheral device. It could be memory to a printer, okay, equally. Um, so what would happen is the buffer keeps the information uh, or data before it's transferred. We'll look at how it works in a moment. So you might get asked, incidentally, you might get asked a question firstly, what is a buffer? You might get asked a question then, what is an interrupt? And then you might get a question of how do buffers and interrupts work? Or you might get one or the other, all right? So just be aware of that. So these are the simple definitions. We'll look at how they work in a minute. An interrupt is the message sent to the control unit in the processor, okay? So an interrupt, a message is sent to the control unit in the processor. That's simply what an interrupt is. Right, so uses of buffers and interrupts when transferring data between memory and storage. This is the sort of answer you'd be looking at. Now, if you only got a four mark question, then you obviously don't need four of these points, really. If you've got an eight mark question, you need to write this. You could potentially get an essay type question to describe this sort of process. So, data from the primary memory fills up the buffer. The processor can then continue other tasks. The buffer is then emptied to storage. An interrupt is sent to request the buffer is refilled. The interrupt priority is compared with the current task. The priority then assigns the interrupt in a queue. Data is then arranged into packets and blocks. The data is checked on arrival using a suitable method, e.g. the parity check. Okay, so that is how it works. If you're not too sure on this, then I'd suggest you look at your course notes that you've done on this um, and maybe try and draw out a diagram to see how it works. But um, th they are the key points that you need to need to know for how buffers and interrupts work. So remember, you can't have the data go straight from primary memory to the peripheral device because it won't go uh, very quickly um, and it will slow down the processor trying to transfer that. So we just fill up the buffer first and let the processor do another job in the meantime while it's filling up, okay? Um, so that we don't waste time uh, and uh, unnecessary time using that processor basically. So that's the reason why we have the buffers. So that is a description of how it works. All right. Again, just a definition you need to learn, really. You don't need to understand fully. That obviously is an understanding one, but the others you don't need to fully understand at this point is the definitions that are important. So they're the components of the processor. It's probably one of the most difficult topics that most people struggle with because you haven't got all the information really yet, um, especially for these three here. This one here, um, that section there should be clear for you. So rewind the video and pause it there. That should make sense if you run through it a few times. Okay. Um, I hope that helped a little bit. I know it's quite confusing. Do some research around it if you need to. Just be aware that that is all you need to know though really for the exams. For the first two sets here, you're generally only going to get two mark questions, maybe three mark questions for each. Okay, so it might ask you what control unit is for a couple of marks. It might ask you um, to name two registers for two marks for each or four, three marks for each, something like that. Um, you won't get asked much on those ones. These ones could be a little bit more, but not much when you look at the size of them. However, this one could be a big, big question. So uh, don't worry too much about this. You need to learn these definitions, don't understand this. You do need to understand this section here. So just be aware of that.